want to invite you to open up your Bibles to the, to the Gospel of John chapter 19. Today, the Gospel of John chapter 19. I'm going to start in verse 25. We're continuing our series that we're calling the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. And if you've been here the last couple of weeks, you know that Jesus hung on the cross for six hours. And during the course of him hanging on the cross for six hours, he made seven statements, only seven. These seven statements are the dying words of Jesus. And each one of those seven statements has significance. They have meaning. Um, and they teach us something about the heart of God, right? Now, two weeks ago, we saw that um, Jesus looked down at the people that were crucifying him. And he looks at them and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. And we talked about how even in the midst of Jesus being unjustly wronged, that he was able to pour out forgiveness. And we get that example through him. And last week we talked about the interaction. We looked at the interaction between Jesus and the two criminals on the cross. And we see the guy that was on Jesus' left and to his dying breath, he hurls abuse at Jesus and rejects Jesus. And yet the guy on the right, confesses his sin, confesses that Jesus is righteous, and then cries out to Jesus to save him. And then Jesus makes the statement today, you will be with me in paradise. Now today we're going to look at the third saying of Jesus on the cross. Let's read it together. John chapter 19, verse 25. So, but Jesus, or rather, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Obviously, Mary was a popular name back then. Uh, John 19, 26, it says, When Jesus saw his mother and his disciples whom he loved, or the disciple whom he loved, standing nearby, that was John, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And this key point there, the last part, he said, from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. And so Jesus being crucified, he's just said to the criminal on his right, today you're going to be with me in paradise. The scripture says he looks down, he sees his mother, and he sees the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, who was the only disciple who hadn't taken, taken off. And he looks at Mary and he says, woman, behold your son. John is now your son. And John, this is now your mother. It said from that moment forward, Mary went to live with John and he stayed in her house for the rest of her life. John took care of his, uh, Jesus' mother until the day that she died. Now, honestly, guys, this is one of those verses that over the years I've never paid much attention to. In my preaching and in my study, I've, I've always kind of cruised past this story right here because at first glance, it seems like that it, it doesn't really compare to some of the more weighty statements that Jesus makes on the cross. I mean, when you look at it and just at, at first glance, compare it to statements like, Father, why have you forsaken me? And, and it is finished. That this saying of Jesus on the cross just feels like a side note where Jesus is just taking care of some family business. But the more that I've looked at it, and the more that I've studied it, the more I realize that this is a moment in the life and the death of Jesus that has real significance, real theological, um, biblical, practical significance for our lives. And so, and, and, and we know that because Jesus, and I'll show you, but Jesus is being incredibly intentional with his words and with his actions. And as he's being so intentional with his words and his actions, we are going to get a, a pretty amazing glimpse into the heart of our God. Okay, now, let me say this, the, and I want you to hear this. The only way for us to really get our minds around the significance of this moment is for us to stop for a second and consider the situation. We've got to consider what's happening here, what's going on, because... The content of what Jesus is saying to Mary is only significant because of the moment or the situation in which he's saying it. Okay, so let me ask you guys a question. What's happening in that very moment? What's going on in that very moment in time? At the moment that Jesus stops and takes care of the needs of his mother, what's he doing in that moment? Well, he's paying for the sin of the world. Think about the significance of the moment he stops and deals with Mary's needs. He is paying 
for the sin of the world. He is paying the penalty. He is paying the cost for your sin and for mine. And here's another reason why that is significant, that he's paying for the sin of the world. He's paying the cost of your sin and mine because that cost that he's paying, church, is the highest cost any human being will ever, ever pay. The cost that Jesus is paying in this particular moment is the highest cost any human being will ever pay or ever has paid. Let's think about that for a second. Think about the cost that Jesus is paying physically in order to make propitiation, big word, for your sin and for mine, to make atonement, to pay for it. Think about the physical cost. He is suffering one of the most painful experiences of physical torture that any person could possibly endure. At this point in the cross, he's been whipped. He, uh, uh, he's been whipped with the, what the scripture says, the cat of nine tails. It was just a little handle with nine pieces of leather that came out of it. And the, the leather had all these bone fragments and rocks and they attached to it. And so when they whipped you, it would kind of attach to your back and then they would pull it off and then do it again over and over again to Jesus. And so his back at this point is completely torn to shreds. He's been punched repeatedly in the face by this point. The Romans have taken a thorn bush, they've cut some of the thorns off of it, they've fashioned it into a circular crown and then crushed it down on his head. He, is, he has suffered an incredible loss of blood at this point. He's, he's desperately weak. He's desperately thirsty. We know that because he can't carry the cross all the way up to the hill. They call Golgotha. And so they have to bring this other guy in just to carry the cross up to the top. He gets to the top. The Roman soldiers, his executioners, take spikes. And they drive it into his wrists and drive it through his feet and fasten him to that piece of wood with spikes. And then they take the cross that he is attached to by spikes. They raise it up. It slams into the ground. And all his weight, all his weight for six hours is being held by these spikes attached to his wrists and feet. The physical cost he's paying for your sin right there is enormous. But think about this. He's not only enduring and paying a physical cost right there, he's paying a mental one. We know historically that when, folk, when uh, men were crucified, they crucified them naked. They did it to humiliate them. They weren't, the stuff you see on TV where they're wearing loincloths, it's not accurate. They, they did it to humiliate them and so they would suffer shame and be completely exposed to the world there on the cross. In addition to that, Jesus most likely going through that, he's suffering all these uh, abuses being hurled at him, insults being cast at him. And so, I mean, he's human. He's dying on the cross as a human. Nobody likes that. And so not only is he suffering physically, but he's suffering and paying an enormous cost mentally. But church, honestly, the physical and the mental cost that Jesus is paying is nothing compared to the cost that he's paying in that moment spiritually. See, the Bible teaches, and hear this, the Bible teaches that Jesus at that moment was enduring the wrath of a holy God. That Jesus, as he hung on the cross, was receiving the wrath of God. God, a holy, righteous, all-powerful God, was pouring out his wrath on Jesus so that you and I would not have to. And, and, and church, why is that a big deal? Why is that a massive cost that Jesus must pay to drink the full cup of the wrath of God for your sin and my sin? And here's the answer. Because what the scripture teaches us is that Jesus has existed eternally with the Father. That Jesus has existed in a perfect, loving, holy, sinless perfected, loving relationship with his father. Their relationship was perfectly sinless. No sin existed between the father and the son forever. And that's what made it perfect, okay? And so, as they forever and ever and ever and ever and ever are existing in this perfect fellowship, everything's been amazing between the two of them until this moment. And in this moment, on the cross, for the first time in eternity, something entered into their relationship that had never been there before. It was sin. Sin entered in the relationship between the Father and the Son. Don't turn there. Just listen. We'll have it up on the screen. Paul talks about this moment. 
in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Paul says that he, that's God, made him, that's Jesus, he made him who knew no sin. Paul is saying that Jesus did not know sin. He never sinned. He never felt the sting of sin. He never felt the shame that comes with sin. He had never been sinful. And it says this, as he made him who knew no sin, watch what it says, to be sin. To be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him for the first time in eternity. For the first time Forever, one of the two persons of the Trinity did not sin. The scripture says he became sin. Jesus became our sin. And a relationship that Jesus had enjoyed forever was ripped from him. And that's why Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane sweating blood out of his forehead. Jesus did not sweat blood in the Garden of Gethsemane saying, Father, is there any way that this cup can pass for me? He's not doing that because of the nails. That's why on the cross, he's saying, Father, why have you forsaken me? Because God is absolutely holy. He cannot endure sin. He must punish sin. And Jesus on the cross became our sin. And God is pouring out his wrath on Jesus so that he will not pour his wrath out on you and me. It's called the gospel. It's called the gospel. Now here's the thing. At this moment on the cross, think about this. At this moment on the cross, when Jesus is paying the highest possible cost any human being will ever pay, and at the very moment where Christ was performing the most significant act in human history, he stops to make sure that a desperate widow had somebody to give her a place to stay and buy her groceries. It's unbelievable. But listen to this, listen carefully. It is not incredibly significant that Jesus does something like this. Jesus was always doing stuff like this. He was always feeding people. He was always taking care of people's needs, healing people, loving people, caring for people. It's not incredibly significant that Jesus does this. Church, what makes it so incredibly significant is the moment that he does it. Now think about this. This hit me this week. Why does Jesus do it on the cross? Why does he stop in that moment, greatest moment in history, paying for the sin of the world? Why does he stop right there and do it? Why didn't he do it the night before? Think about that. The night before, he's in the upper room. The scripture says that John, the disciple that Jesus loved, that he just talked to about Mary, the scripture says he's actually leaning against Jesus, against Jesus at one point. Why not just lean down at John and say, hey, John, I'm going to die tomorrow. Can you take care of Mary after I'm gone? Why does he need to do that? Think about this. Why didn't he do it after? I mean, that actually would have made more sense to me. Jesus is going to die. Three days later, he's going to rise from the grave. He's going to appear to the disciples. He hangs out with the disciples and Mary for a long time after that before he ascends into heaven. Why not just pull them aside and do something he's done a thousand times, take care of somebody and say, John, I'm leaving, send to heaven. Do you mind taking care of Mary until uh, the end of her life? He could have easily done it then. Why, church? Why? Why does he choose this moment? This moment, hanging on the cross, Paying for the sin of the world to stop and take care of Mary's future. Think about this. There's something else. And this week I thought, this absolutely, Jesus is doing something unique and significant in this moment. Because think about this. This is the only statement that Jesus makes on the cross that did not have to be made on the cross. Every single, he said seven things. The other six were statements that were absolutely unique to the cross of Jesus. This statement to Mary and to John is the only one that didn't have to be said in that moment. Every single statement he makes on the cross was either a direct fulfillment of prophecy that the scripture said had to take place during the death of the Messiah or it was Jesus responding to a very unique situation because he was dying on a cross. Just walk through them very quickly with you. Father, forgive them. They, they know not what they're doing. Who's he talking to? He's talking to people that just put the spikes in his wrists. Unique to the cross. Had to say it right then. Um, today you will be with me in paradise. Who's he talking to? 
He's talking to the criminal that just asked for his forgiveness on the cross and there was no other today that Jesus was going to be in paradise but that one. Completely unique to the cross of Jesus. Jesus says, I thirst. Why does he say, I thirst? Well, you're going to hear more about it. That is a fulfillment of prophecy that the Old Testament said was absolutely unique to the death of the Messiah. Completely unique to the cross. Had to say it in that moment. Father, why have you forsaken me? Absolutely unique to the cross. There is no other time in history except for the cross. That statement would have even been applicable. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus only dies once. It had to be made on the cross. It is finished. There is only one time that Jesus pays for the sin of the world, and he will not do it again. It was absolutely unique to the cross. But this statement, but this statement, where Jesus takes care of Mary's needs, he could have done it any time. He could have done it any time. The cross was not a surprise to Jesus. Jesus knew the cross was coming. He knew it for a really, really long time. And he could have taken care of Mary's needs at any point in the journey. Why does he choose this most significant moment in history, paying for the sin of the world to make sure somebody was going to take care of his mom? And here's why. Here's why. Jesus intentionally chooses this moment on the cross to take care of the needs of his mother because he's revealing something to us. Intentionally opening the door for us and letting us take a view and have a view of something about the heart of God that I think most of us would have missed otherwise. He's revealing something to us about the heart of God. And here's what he's revealing. That God doesn't just care for you and love you by offering you salvation. God does not just love you and he does not just care for you by giving you salvation and paying for your sins, but God wants to love you and God wants to care for you in the smallest details of your life. This is a beautiful picture that Jesus shows us of how God actually loves us. This is a gorgeous picture picture that a lot of us need to hear in this room of actually the depth to which Jesus and the Lord actually care for us and love us. He takes the time as he's shedding his blood for the sins of the world that yes, to show us that he can meet the most significant need in the universe, which is our sin. He can meet the most significant need in the universe, our sin. And yet at the very same time, he is not too busy. And he is not too tired. He's not too distracted to care for one desperate widow who needs a place to sleep. I believe with all my heart, guys, that, that Jesus intentionally chooses this moment to demonstrate the span of care for our lives that he loves us and he cares for us, not in the big things in our lives, but also, but also in the smallest details of who we are. And church, this has been good for me to hear this week. It's been really good for me to study. I just want to confess to you because I'm one of these guys. And I know there's a lot of us like this here that a lot of times I have a very short-sighted view of the depths to which God cares for me. I have a very limited view of how God loves me and cares for me. Because when I think about, when I'm thinking about how does God love me, what does he think about me? How does he care for me? I have a tendency to only think that he cares about my sin. I don't know if anybody else out there like that. I have a tendency to just think he just cares about my sin. That he loves me enough and he cares for me enough to die for my sin. And he also cares about whether or not I'm sinning. But I have a tendency to just let it be limited to that. And I think a lot of times I just think he doesn't care about some of the stupid stuff that I struggle with on a daily basis. And I think the point of this saying of Jesus on the cross is to show us that's just not true. The point of this saying of Jesus on the cross is to show us that God does not just love you as a savior that wants to take away your sin, but that God loves you as a father. God loves you as a father that wants to care for you the way a good father would a daughter or a son. That God doesn't just love you as a savior that wants to take away your sin, but that God loves you the way that a good husband would care for and pursue and love and cherish his wife. 
It shows us that God doesn't want to just care for you and love you as a savior that takes away your sin, but he wants to love you and care for you as a friend that the scripture says will walk with you closer than a brother. This story shows us that, that God doesn't want to just love you as a, and care for you as a savior that takes away your sin, but he loves you and cares for you the way a dying son would care for his widowed mother. And so I just want to ask you, get you to think about this personally. Is this your view of God that, that he's too busy or he's too preoccupied with the redemption of the world to care about the stuff that's bringing you pain right now? Do you, uh, do you, do you have these minor details of your life that you would never bring and talk about or prayed about to God or, or throw them upon him because you just think at the end of the day he doesn't care? Listen, say it one last time. Jesus did not have to say this on the cross. He didn't have to do it, but he took the time when paying for the sins of the world to care for the ordinary, mundane, everyday sins or everyday needs of a person that he loved. And I think this glimpse into the heart of God that Jesus shows us on the cross is probably what Peter's referring to in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, watch this. Very interesting verse here. 1 Peter 5, 6, Peter starts off this thought and he says, therefore humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. And if you were to just stop right there and only read that verse, you would think, well, Peter's talking about God is big and he's mighty and he's got this big hand and we're just supposed to submit to that, which we are. Uh, but God is this big, awesome thing, doesn't have time for us. But then watch what he says in the very next verse. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in the proper time. Verse seven, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Cast all your anxiety, your cares upon him. You cast, word means throw, let go of, hurl, toss. Cast all your cares upon him, let him go. All your cares, why? Because he took away your sin, yeah? Because he cares for you. Some of you in the room are sick today. And the span of your sickness goes all the way from cancer to you got a cough. And I think a lot of us, when we go through stuff like that, we just like, we, it just feels wrong to us to cry out to God in the little stuff. I, I, I had the flu several weeks ago and it was the worst flu I think I've ever had. I was sick for like three weeks and I just got sick of being sick. Anybody ever been there? You're just, you've been sick for so long. I'm so sick of being sick. And about two and a half weeks into the deal, I, and I wish I would have done this earlier, but I just, I cried out to God. I was like, God, could you please just heal me of this stupid flu? I'm sick of being sick. And I immediately began to feel guilty. And this guilt just came over me because I thought, <sighs> I just asked God to heal me of the flu. And, and my friend just died in a foreign land for the sake of the gospel. A friend just got shot because he left America and went to tell people about Jesus. And I'm asking God to heal me the flu. And it just felt ridiculous to come to a God who, who deals in the salvation of, of unreached people groups to come to him about some little sickness that I was gonna get over in a few days. Some of you in this room are lonely room this size, you're lonely. You're, you're lonely and, and you're tired of being lonely. And you're lonely in marriage, you're, you're lonely because you're not married. And, and it just feels so vain to come to the Lord and, and, and talk to him about that and cast that care upon him because you know the Bible and you know in the Bible it says you're supposed to be satisfied completely in him. So it just feels ridiculous to come to God and go, God, I'm, I'm lonely and I'm tired of being lonely. But if there's anything the scripture teaches us is that God cares for that kind of stuff. God cares about the flu. God cares about our sickness. God cares about our loneliness. And the scripture doesn't say he just doesn't care about it, but we're actually supposed to take that and throw it and cast it upon him. 
I was thinking this week of just some of the stuff that I personally think it's so goofy to talk to God about. And I'm, I'm not trying to be funny here. I'm really not. I, 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 this was something that I wrestle with. But I was thinking about like my weight and body image. There's a lot of us that just wrestle with that. And it, it feels so vain to come to God and say, God, I'm struggling with the stuff I eat. I'm struggling with my self-control. I'm struggling about the way I feel in my own skin. And it just feels ridiculous to come to God and say, God, would you give me the strength to, to control what I eat or be content with the way I look? And what this scripture says is that God cares about all that stuff. Cast all your anxiety upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. There have been times in my life where I've been apathetic about God. And I'm just going to admit that to you. Y'all think I'm a pastor. I just walk around with Bible in my hand, just, just worshiping Jesus all day, every day. I don't. I'm a human being just like you. And there have been seasons of my life where I struggled with my faith. I'd come into places like this and, and I just, everybody else got their hands in the air and crying and I just don't feel anything. And I would have never come to God and said, God, would you help me in my apathy? God, would you, I'm so apathetic towards you right now and why would I not come to him with my apathy? Because I think he's mad at me about my apathy. The scripture says that God cares for you and that kind of stuff. That, that even that kind of stuff where you're struggling, you're failing, you're sinning, he wants you to come to him. Don't run from him in those moments. Come to him in those moments and take all that stuff and lay it at his feet because he cares for you. Some of you are anxious about a test or about money or about a job and you haven't cast those cares upon Jesus because you just aren't quite sure that he cares. But you know somebody else that probably felt guilty about burdening Jesus with the little simple stuff. You know, somebody that probably felt a lot of guilt about even the concept of coming to Jesus with, with the small details of her life. Mary. Mary knew Jesus was going to die. From the moment she conceived, she knew that she held within her womb the Messiah that would one day die for the sin of the world. And don't you think at some point in the story, because we know that Joseph, she was a widow, Joseph has died at this point. Don't you think at some point along the way, she probably thought in her mind, who's going to take care of me after Jesus dies? Don't you think that, that she thought that and don't you think she probably felt guilty about it? My son is going to go and he's going to be tortured for the sin of the world. I don't want to come to him and ask him the question, who's going to take care of me? But Jesus puts all that stuff to rest. It's one of the seven sayings of the cross that he didn't have to say in that moment. He stops in the middle of paying for all of this and says, Mary, I love you. I care about that. I'm going to make sure you're taken care of. I want to I end today by telling you a story where Jesus probably more tangibly than any other time in my life showed me that I don't just care about your salvation, Matt, but I care about the details of the pain you're going through in your life. I care about that. And I want to show you that I care about that. And I've had to go back to the story in my mind many times to remind my soul that God cares for me and he loves me. And if, if you're a long time stoner, you've been around here for years, you've heard me tell the story before, and I tried to come up with a different one, but I could not come up with a better one than this, so you're going to have to hear it again. Because God just blew me away with this, still does, thinking about it. When I was 11 years old, we were in First Baptist, Athens, Texas, and we were singing a song, Because He Lives. And y'all remember the song, Because He Lives? Nope, nobody, too young. All right. All um, right. <laughs> Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. And because I know, oh, that he holds the future, <laughs> that life is worth the living just because he lives. And, um, and I, I don't know why I remember this. This just stuck out in my memory. I was 11. My mom leans over to me at the end of the song, and she says, when I die, I want you to bury me in a red dress, and I want you to play that song in my funeral. And I remembered it. 
And when my mom died, I, and my mom and I were very close, loved my mother. And uh, she was amazing. She loved Jesus. When she died, we, we buried her in a red dress, and that was the last song that we sang before we put her in the ground. And a few weeks later, after we buried her, I, uh, I went on a mission trip to Belize with, I don't even remember the group I was with. Um, and one night we were doing worship after we had worked all day and, and uh, it was about 10.30 at night, it was late and one of the indigenous pastors that was with us <coughs> said, hey, I'm thinking about going evangelizing tonight. Does anybody wanna go with me? And I remember looking at my watch and going, I'm in. So I go with him and, and we go out and we drive out into the jungle the middle of the jungle in the middle of the night. And when you think jungle, that's it, jungle, right? And we go to this village and there's these grass huts. When you think about grass huts, that's, that's what it looked like, grass huts. There's no electricity. The, there's one fire that's kind of burning out and there's this fork in the road and, the, and, and the, there's like a village down there a few hundred yards and a village down there a few hundred yards. And, and he says, okay, here's what we're gonna do, Matt. I'm going to the left, you go to the right. All right, I'll see you in about an hour. I'm like, what? We're in a jungle, man, in the middle of the night. I was envisioning me going with you, but I didn't want to look weak or whatever, so I just took off, and, and it was ridiculous because it's, it's 11 by this point, and, and I'm knocking, like, on the bamboo of the grass huts or whatever, and, and people are looking at me, and I'm like, do you want to talk about Jesus? Can I share? And they're, what? And they just think I'm ridiculous and stupid, and nothing happens, nothing whatsoever. They're just looking at me like I'm crazy. And so finally I give up and I walk back to the car and I'm waiting for this guy to come back and I sit down on a log. True, everything I'm about to say is true before Jesus and I'm sitting there and I'm kind of dejected and all of a sudden this little kid just comes walking up to me and he stands there and I don't know how old he was, he was 10, 11, 12, something like that and he looked at me and he said, in broken English, he said, I heard that you were walking around telling people about Jesus and I want to hear about Jesus. And... I was like, all right, God, this is easy, right? So I'm like, so I sit there and I just start sharing the gospel with him and, and the kid, long story short, he's just trusting Jesus right there in, in the jungle. And, and I was just thrilled with that. It's just, that's a miracle story. We just stop right there, land the plane, game over, you know, sing, Aaron. And I mean, great story. I'm in the jungle. I'm, I'm, I'm an idiot. I'm the worst evangelist ever. And this guy just walks up to me and says, tell me about Jesus. And I do it. And so I'm so excited but then as soon as kind of the excitement wore off, I started getting sad because I realized that this is one of those things that I would love to call my mom and tell her. <laughs> mom, I'm in the middle of the jungle and, I, and this kid just walks up and he's a Christian now. And, and so I just, and I started getting really sad and just, ah, oh, the weight of all that just started crushing me. And, and, I, and I started to pray. And this is what I prayed I said, God, I just got a question. I said, God, does she know what just happened? Does my mom know? Because my mom's in glory. And so I asked the Lord, I said, does she know? I remember that's the only thing, because I want my mom to know, does she know what just happened? And I was sitting there waiting for the pastor to come back and something happened that was probably besides my salvation, my call to ministry, the most tangible movement of God in my entire life. I was sitting there on this log waiting for the guy and I looked down the road and I see this guy walking up the road. It's dark, I can barely make him out. I think it's probably the pastor and so I'm like, okay, finally it's midnight, we can go home. And this guy comes walking up, he walks right up to me and I realize it's not the pastor and this other guy's walking right up to me and so I'm thinking, sweet God, Two in one night. You're awesome, man. This is incredible. We're just going to knock him down. And so I'm, I'm in my brain thinking, I'm going to lead this guy to Jesus. This story's getting better as I go along. And so he doesn't know I'm a Christian yet. I haven't told him I'm a Christian yet. I haven't started talking about Jesus yet. I'm just trying to strike up a conversation with this random guy in the middle of the night that walks up to me in the middle of the jungle. This kid, this guy, kid, he's probably in his 20s. He's wearing a guitar on his back. And so I'm thinking, okay, he obviously plays music. I'm going to strike up a conversation with him and then I'm going to talk to him about Jesus, right? And so I asked him, I said, do you play the guitar? And he said, I do. And I said, what kind of music do you play? And he said, I play all kinds of music. Again, this guy does not know I'm a Christian. He said, I play all kinds of music. And I said, well, why don't you play me a song? And he said, what song would you like me to play? 
And I said, I don't know, why don't you pick? He pulls his guitar around and he starts singing because he lives. I don't remember, people ask me several times after I preach this, I, they're like, what did you do next? And I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember what happened after that. I don't remember where that guy went. I have no memory of it because as soon as he started playing that song, I absolutely lost it. I lost it. Of all the millions of songs he could play, he didn't know as a Christian, he picked that one after I had just asked the Lord, God does she know? If you think that's a coincidence, you're nuts. It's not a coincidence. What kind of a God does that? What kind of a God that doesn't just concern himself with the salvation of souls in the middle of the night in a jungle? What kind of God would not just concern himself with that, but he would move heaven and earth just to take a moment in the middle of heaven and hell to minister in a really small way to a young guy that was sad because he lost his mom? What kind of God does that? Our God does. Our God does. The kind of God that stops in the middle of paying the highest cost any person would ever pay to take care of his mom. So the application today is very simple. It's very simple. What do we do with this truth? It's simple. Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Let's pray. Before we move on too quickly from this moment and start getting ready for Super Bowl parties, let's just, let's camp out here for just a second. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, just want to think about for just a second, is there, is there anything in your life that, that you need right now to let go of? That you've been holding on because at the end of the day, you struggle with really believing God cares about that kind of stuff. I wonder if this morning you could just kind of take that and, and place it at the foot of the cross where a God who pays for the sins of the world takes care of needs, cares for us. And I can't promise you he's gonna do what he did for me in the middle of the night in the jungle, but I'll tell you this, I will promise you that he's with you, he hears you, and he cares, and he will walk with you through it. You will never walk alone. And one day when you're with him, it'll all make sense. I promise you. Jesus, I love you so much. I thank you that that night you did that. You didn't have to, but that's what you do. And it's my joy to worship you today. I pray that you would give us the strength to cast our cares on you because you care for us. And so we ask that in your name today. Amen. Amen.